Welcome back to another Fancy Football Predictive Analytics podcast with Reese T. Fertiller and the very esteemed Mr. Bob Harris. How are you doing? Uh, Reese was the esteemed one. I'm just here to coattail like always. <laughs> Come on now. Welcome to my life. I'm, I'm trying to ride his coattail. Uh, just trying his- to hang out with famous authors and whatnot, trying to gain a little bit of credibility here in this business. Gain a little traction if I can. Okay. You and me both. So jumping right into it, the biggest storyline that's come out the past 24 hours, besides COVID, has been Urban yeah. Myers firing. Yeah. A lot of people have thought this has been a long time coming. So the main question for fantasy is, how does that impact Trevor Lawrence, both for the uh, final three games this season and for long term? What are, so Short term, it's got to be a load of pressure off. I mean, he's come out the last two weeks and he's made some public comments that kind of tell you where he's been at on this uh the week not this week but last week came out and addressed the James Robinson situation and basically said look the best player has to be on the field also I was impressed because he knows who his best player is right <laughs> I mean uh, good kudos to you uh he gained a little gained a little uh bit with me in that regard but beyond that you know coming out this week and talking about we've just got to eliminate the drama well he got his wish and I, I think it tells you you know, the investment in him, uh, the importance of that. Now, do I expect a sudden turnaround? You, you know, weird things happen in these cases. The emotion, it's obviously a plus matchup for them this week, right? So, I mean, who knows what happens uh, in regard? I think it could go either way. I think if you're a fantasy football player, uh, you should be careful about investing in the assets that wear the teal and black. Uh, it's not probably a a great investment, right? Even James Robinson, you know, hasn't been high end. And I think it's as much with his knee and heel issues. He just doesn't look like he's full speed when he's full speed. I mean, I'd be loving to play him and I'm guessing he will get more than the six carries he got, you know, in this last game. And I don't think they'll throw it a thousand times. Was it a thousand Reese or was it 40 or whatever it was? Close and, and maybe that works in, you know, Lawrence's favor as well. I just, their problems go well beyond urban Meyer. Although, don't let me shortchange him. He was a huge problem, right? Um, but, but like, you know, a receiving core that lacks kind of playmaking ability. I, mean, I think that's a big issue. Marvin Jones, God bless you. I love Marvin Jones, heavily invested in myself in best ball, you know, always going for the cheaper assets in a group, right? Uh, you know, so when everyone's going chark, I'm waiting rounds later because I'm old and mean and cheap and trying to get the, 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 the better deal. But I mean, you know, it's just, it's not, he's not quite at that same level he's been. And, and, you know, the loss of Chark hurt and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, and LaVisca Chenault, they asked him to play out of his natural or more natural spot, right? They had to move out to the X when Chark went out and he just, he can't separate on the outside, right? So they kind of lost his playmaking ability. They moved him back inside and maybe Laquan Treadwell is now the best of the bunch, right? But, but, and that tells you something. So that's the bigger problem. The playmaking talent around him is not great. Maybe the scheme can improve a little bit. Maybe Daryl Bevel will have a little more leeway. His history in the NFL, you know, is it's extensive, not super high end. So, I, you know, I, I don't have high expectations this year. Hopefully they can get something right uh, next year. Um, the evidence I have suggests they won't get it right because why? I have, my, you know, <laughs> the last uh, however many years. I mean, it's been, what, four coaches and is almost uh, since, like, what, 2012 or something? So. I don't have a lot of hope here. I hope Lawrence can be enough to carry this team to a degree. And I think a good quarterback can do that, but they need, they need a credible head coach, you know, and they need to dial back on the drama and hopefully they will do both those things. Go shot con go. <laughs> I just have two th- questions for you. One is, and I'll, I'll bang bang to you on this, but are you bullish or bearish on Trevor Lawrence throughout his career? A and B it seems to me that if this gets settled, James Robinson and at the end will be values in next year's drafts. Sure. And that's, you know, that's the first thing we look for, right guys is, you know, uh, first thing I do at the end of the season is I get out my notepad and my pencil and I start making lists of players who disappointed everybody, who everyone's going to be really irritated at next year at draft day. And I'm going to look for those guys as values, right? So there will probably be a Jaguar or two on that list. Um, and it's, you know, I'm, 
I don't want to say I'm bearish on Trevor Lawrence. I, I'm, I mean, I'm kind of bullish on the talent, right? But, the, you know, I'd like to see the situation get better. The the history of the organization is is not great, you know. So I'm not enthusiastic about it. I'm not enthusiastic about Zach Wilson. The circumstances aren't great for these guys getting off the right foot. That said, we've seen quarterbacks get off to miserable starts uh, and go on to greatly successful careers. And I see one of them on Monday Night Football when I'm not listening to it on ESPN and I'm listening to him and his brother. Uh, the Manning brothers. So Peyton Manning got off to a horrible start too, right? So, I mean, it, it happens and guys can rebound and maybe, you know, the hotter the fire, the harder the steel. Yeah. If that's true, then Trevor Lawrence will be the best player ever. And Aikman fit that as well. Yeah. Aikman had a miserable first year. Yeah, th- th- there have been multiple examples of that. Well, you brought up your list theory, uh, list thing. I remember last year you were on the podcast and mentioned how James Connor was be on that list. Look how he's panned out for you. Yes, he's paying off, paying off nicely. And he's like a double hit, right? He is like someone who disappointed people last year. Also, the cheaper asset in a pairing, right? And I just, I have zero shares of Chase Edmonds. And I'm, you know, I'm not going to sit here and crow over somebody who missed time because they were hurt or not. But but I am going to crow over James Conner, who had established a pretty good role, you know, before that injury and was turning into exactly what I said he would be. Now, same token, I'll go ahead and take my hits on the Philip Lindsay's of the world and some of the other free square plays. <laughs> Uh, that I went with. But look, I was still thinking like until he got on the COVID list this week, I'm finally going to be right. It's Lindsay <laughs> against the Jets. And uh, maybe not. But you we're talking about the lack of talent surrounding Trevor Lawrence. That's an Urban Meyer problem. He had the best draft, draft capital going in. He had the most free agent. Uh, they had the most cash space. They had the most money to give out. And they still couldn't get it right. They drafted Travis Etienne in the first round when they easily could have gotten him in the second round and taken like Elijah Moore or somebody like that. Oh, yeah. And they also could have gone out in free agency, try to snag Kenny Galladay. It's one of those ex receivers that they're missing terribly right now, but they didn't. Instead, Herbert Myers claiming that he didn't like the free agency thing. Right. So, yeah. First of all, the Giants would say, wow, wish the uh, Jaguars had gotten Kenny Galladay. Um, <laughs> but, but no, I get your, your point is taken, but, you know, how much of that is Urban Meyer and how, you know, I mean, Trent Balky, who is going to stick around at least through the end of the season. We'll see if that changes after the season. But, but you know, I mean, how much of that is organizational and how much of it was Meyer? I'm guessing a fair portion of it was Meyer. So whoever comes in, I saw Mike Flory on Pro Football Talk, you know, with his usual chiming in. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 you know, don't always agree with Mike Florio, but when he said, hey, call Tony Dungy and say, Tony, you want to come coach or run the organization or do you know a coach? And, and I think, you know, finding some people who have had success over the course of time, Shad Khan could do himself a great favor uh, by uh, by leaning on some experienced people with histories of success in the NFL. He's done it in the past, right? Tom Coughlin, uh, you know, brought him in. And uh, so, uh, you know, with mixed results, but I mean, I thought that was, that's a good approach, right? I mean, you know, and he had history with Coughlin anyway. So I thought that was a good approach. And look, you know, to Tom Coughlin, I talked to Fred Taylor like two weeks ago and he couldn't say, he can't say enough great things about Tom Coughlin. I'm just saying, you know, people have a view of Tom Coughlin. I think his players see him differently or the people who have been associated see him differently than maybe the rest of the world. Um, But, but that aside, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's a matter of getting the right people in there and they, they have missed every damn time in their recent shots. So they need to get a hit. I'm just shot. Khan needs a hit. This there's no doubt about it. He's, you know, and I don't, you know, history tells me he's not great at this. Yeah. But Tony Dungy has had success wherever he went. He built exactly. the Super Bowl contender, John Gruden won with the Tampa. <clears throat> and right. then yes, he had pain Manning, but he still won the Super Bowl with, sure with the Colts and the thing T- Tony Dungy is known for is his character and that's been the problem with this past head coach Urban Meyer so yeah, I do I think he would reach out to Dungy instead of other people other like coaches. like was this all like the least surprising outcome you know <laughs> since Bobby Petrino <laughs> left everybody a note in their locker or whatever I mean you know just going into this I mean you know what is urban Meyer's great talent? I don't know. I don't follow his college football that closely. I look at some of the, you know, people who have been around him and I, you know, clearly he overlooks a lot of things uh, with those around him in order to win. Uh, Maybe that, but, but the thing that caught me most got my attention most 
And I think it's something you see in a lot of people when they get into the NFL level stage is they don't realize the stage they're on. Yeah. And they think they're the smartest guy in the room when the room now is so much larger that, you know, that you're not the king anymore. You're not in Columbus. You're not in Gainesville, right? Where everyone it kowtows to you. You're in the entire world now. And I can think back to, you know, like, God, what, what it really hit me, like with Michael Vick, right? When he was, you know, lying about the whole situation he was in and you're just going, Dude, we all know, man, you're, you know, you're not going to pull this off. You would have pulled this off back at, you know, back at school. Everyone would have said, yeah, that's great. Oh, don't worry about it. But this is a different level. And I think that was the Urban Meyer came in and just, you know, started off with the hiring of the strength coach that was, you know, poorly handled and a poor decision to begin with. But I think not really a poor decision. It was a, it was a something he thought he needed to do and he thought he could get away with uh, until he couldn't get away with it. And so, I think that was just the first in the long series of, uh, of of examples of things that, you know, ended finally with Josh Lambeau. I think it's interesting that the a thing that happened four months ago is the thing that finally got him uh, booted out, but uh, booted out. See what I did there? Kit um, to but, the curb. Kit to the curb, right? right? But I agree. Don't you, uh, you know, I don't often agree with Mike Florio. Or I, yeah, I guess I do. I, he just irritates me. But, me too. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, sometimes he comes up with a pretty damn good point, and that was a pretty good point. Especially if the pendulum swings, like we are, we're in the we're in the age of overreaction. Oh and, sure. And if you go from a poor, you know, values guy to Tony Dungy, it seems like a a boomerang effect. But but then I would come back to say, what organization couldn't use Tony Dungy? You know, I mean, like I don't care if, what team you are he'd make a great advisor. You know what just I mean? A, just, a, just a thoughtful person who, you know, doesn't react out of emotion to things right off the bat. There's no knee-jerk knee reactions with him. I think that's a big deal. Uh, you know, I'm an emotional person and I, you know, I tend to have outbursts and things like that. But honestly, even I know that, you know, and decisions made in, in uh, based on emotion are the worst decisions. I mean, the more you can divorce that from your decision-making process, the better your decisions are going to be. And that's, you know, the, the secret to life is, you know, make a good decision, then make another one, then follow that up with another good decision. I mean, you know, you can make a bad one here and there, but the more good decisions you make, the better off you are. And we see that in Jacksonville where they uh, have done the opposite for quite some time. Yes. But you were talking about him not overreacting. The thing he was getting inflamed with with Gruden was he apologized and let's move on before he understood all the emails that were transpiring. Right. Sure. But they were flaming him on social media and on the national stage. They're like, well, you're, you're part of the people he was offending, but he only, they only thought it was one time and he wasn't overreacting to the situation. And once oh. everything came into light, he then took back his comments. <clears throat> right. We, we, we do evolve as we get more information. It's a true yeah. story. Um, uh, but also, uh, you know, getting flamed on social media is something we should all be not caring about, right? right. Something we should all just say, okay, social media says that. I mean, I get called things every day. Uh, that doesn't make me those things. This makes people, makes the people are calling me that, right? Or saying things about you or whatever. So, I mean, you know, people being true to what they are, I mean, I think we can all step back and anyone who's been around football any length of time has a pretty good understanding of what Tony Dungy is and what he's about. And so, you know, if there's a brief moment where you feel like he wasn't as perfect as you want him to be, hmm, turns out he's human. Who knew? <laughs> <laughs> but switching into a topic that you've probably written a lot about, especially this uh, past week. Oh my gosh. COVID. COVID. It's been rampaging through the NFL. Over, I believe that's over a hundred players on the COVID reserve list. How can fantasy managers take advantage of so many players, some even stars on the COVID? They can't. And, and so but they can make some adjustments, right? So one of the things that normally we don't do or we do, uh, you know, is like you have the early games. You have a Thursday game. You have Saturday games. Maybe you're saying, well, I'll probably just wait until the Sunday games. Don't really know if I want to get. play the early games. If you have people who are playing for sure, play them. Because things change quickly, say Jalen Waddle, say yep. Allen Robinson, says everyone who has gone on the list today, right? So that would be, you know, one strategy to employ. Uh, the other strategy is the same strategy that the NFL teams, I think, are using is they're crossing their fingers and hoping for the best. And, you know, no, I, I think they're doing all the protocols and, and doing sensible, logical things. <clears throat> 
something going back to last year, I, I feel like, you know, the, the NFL, it's easy to, you know, rag on big corporations out to make a bunch of money. <clears throat> also, big corporations that are out there trying to make a lot of money often end up creating uh, procedures and doing things that allow them to make money that help the rest of us. And I think if you look at the NFL, <clears throat> they found a lot of things out. We, I think we as a society learned a lot about COVID from how the NFL handled it, right? Or just what they learned with the testing and the data that, that they collected. And I think it's helped them keep players on the field. I think to this point, I'm, I'm not sure. I know as of Tuesday, there were a lot more. I could probably look this up. Maybe that would even be, I, and I don't have to look far because I think I bookmarked the tweet. But heading into, before today's testing, I think it was not like insane. It was, I, I was surprised by it though. Um, let's see. Here we go. Uh, this was from Mark Sessler, who asked NFL research. Uh, this was yesterday. Um, no, this was two days ago. Okay, so before the today's round of players, players had missed 262 games this season on the COVID list. Uh, last year through week 14, there were 309. I mean, you know, just based on what we see, but that's also something we do as people, right? We look at the narrow band and we think yeah. that's all there is wow, there's 100 people right now. Well, you know, you put that in a larger context and you can see that it's, you know, it's less than last year. Wow, imagine that. So um, it's horrible though. None of this makes it easier for us uh, as fantasy managers. And, and I just, you know, as I've thought about this uh, over the last few days, because obviously we're all trying to, you know, navigate the same murky waters. I'm not really sure how easy it is to navigate, right? I think we're just, you know, as you're sitting here and the, you know, players are just turning up at times. And we saw it last Sunday. David Johnson, I mean, fortunately, he's David Johnson and didn't probably kill anybody. But, you know, a Sunday morning announcement, that's going to, you know, it's entirely possible we have more of those. And so I think the answers to these things, how we navigate, are all solved before the season when we're setting up our rules and we're giving managers the flexibility, the same flexibility the NFL's given them, uh, teams to move players around, uh, to add players, to roster players and have practice squad players or taxi squad players or whatever we do is in the fantasy world. I think that's probably the best answer. And, you know, for the immediate, if you didn't set those rules up in advance, it's pretty hard to change them now. So I'm not sure there are a lot of easy answers. I will be out there willing to listen to every smart person who will tell me how stupid I am for saying that and uh, look for ways to figure this out. But you know, as I'm sitting here, you know, what was it, the half hour before we started this, you know, Alan Robinson doing it. Okay, it's Alan Robinson. It's not going to be the end of the world for me, but what if it was, you know, it could be anyone. Jalen Waddle earlier today was, you know, probably one it's a great matchup and you're, you're hoping to play him, but also, you know, found out DeAndre Hopkins can't play anymore and it's, it has a totally different thing. We, we deal with these things all the time. I think one of the problems is, you know, just it, this whole COVID thing, you know, we we get a little emotional about it, right? We get a little excited about it and, uh, and we tend to react and look, I'm not minimizing or downplaying anything. I'm just, you know, this is human nature. This is how we work as people. Yeah. Can I add two things on the fancy part? One is you said, play them. If they're playing tonight, play them. And I'm going to say play them in their positional play uh, yeah. positions, not in flex. Leave your flex. Yeah. Leave your keep flex your, open. Yes. Yeah, keep your flex open. And Good the job. other is if you have bench spots, take a chance on an upside guy because you never know how the dice are going to roll <clears throat> and right. you're better off rostering a guy who could take advantage of a situation versus having the third string Texans running back, you know? Right. So for example, uh, you know, uh, Michael Fabiano and I run a team in, in the hall of fame fantasy league or whatever. We, and we went out and we grabbed the Ernest Johnson. Yeah. Because what, you know, I mean, Nick Chubb is it, but what if all of a sudden Nick Chubb can't be it? Mm, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, those are the kind of moves that, you know, if you're out there and maybe I should have mentioned that in before a while, I would have looked smart for saying so. But uh, those are the kind of moves that you can make. And, and I think that's something, and, and what you said is exactly right, man. Leave your flexes as flexible as you can. So what you guys are suggesting is try to pick up handcuffs if you see uh, potential open <laughs> roster spots. Say you have a Dontrell Hilliard in there, pick up someone like KJ Osborne if he's on your bit waiver wire just because you don't know what's happening with Thielen and Jefferson. Not Dontrell Hilliard, though, because that would suggest Deontay Foreman isn't ready to go. And that's my guy this week. So stop it right now, Reese. <laughs> <laughs> but I would even say, you know, let's take it a step further. McKissick's out. 
you don't know about Gibson. Now let's look in the Washington yeah. backfield and see if there's an upside guy, right? Because I only have to stash him. We only have so many weeks left, right? Right. And the teams are going to start doing goofy things with their rosters, and we have to be able to take advantage. Yes. Yeah, and, and you know, be ready. This is the time of year anyway to, you know, all the guys that I drafted as free square guys who I'm still not sure I'm wrong about. Phil Lindsay, I'm talking right to you, young man. Um, you can <laughs> let go of those guys now, right? I mean, you're heading into the playoffs. You need to have playable assets or assets that might help you if the circumstances arise. I get it. You know, this week, actually, you know, Lindsay, last guy on the list. I'm guessing he'll be the last guy off the list. But uh, either way, I mean, those are the kind of players that, yeah, you know, the circumstances maybe dictate that I have something here. And maybe you want to let go of some of the, like, you know, work more closely on the positions of scarcity. And that's, of course, first and foremost, running back. So grab up, you know, the extra running backs, the Malcolm Browns, uh, you know, guys who are, you know, make sure people haven't left Chase Edmonds on their, on, you know, off rosters because he's on IR. People like that, uh, go out and, and, and snag them up. So I don't know if I've seen anything. Is Travis Etienne coming back this year? No. Next year. Next year. So I saw, remember when he first got injured, they said four months. And it's pretty close to three and a half or four. That's, so like, yeah. that's like when I tell your mom, I'll get to it tomorrow. Some days, tomorrow never comes. Some days on the NFL, four months really means eh, we're just being nice to the give everybody a reason to have hope that Jacksonville makes the playoffs. Fair enough. Bob, do you have any wise uh, words of wisdom for me on that? Uh, there's more. So I'm just looking at the people who are going on COVID while we're talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Case Keenum. Yeah. So Which the Browns a, have no quarterbacks. Wow. Because it's is it fair to say, you guys well read more than I am, is Baker out this week? Baker is a long shot. I mean, I don't think, you know, I think anyone who has been vaccinated and can get two positive tests or two negative tests, if they tested positive in a 24 hour period are, are okay to play. Um, but that's going to be a mess here. Let me just double check and see if I've read everything correctly that I just thought I read on my little watch and my phone. All these things come through. That's a lot of information all at one time. But it looks like Case Keenum will be out. Uh, so they need to get the Broncos Hinton, you know, type of situation. Yeah, That's they had a, they would have came in handy. They had, they added Nick Mullins to you know today from promoted him. <laughs> so That's a Nick, right there, Nick I mean, Mullins is on his fourteen this year because he was with San Francisco. He was with Miami. He's been Eagles. Uh, Eagles, yeah. He's been bouncing around. Yeah. As Sigmund Bloom just said, I guess if the Browns have 11 COVID negative players, they will play every play. Yeah. We love Sigmund. Sigmund's one of those. Some people are glass half full. Some are half empty. Sigmund's like, give me a new glass. Let's let's pour some more water in it. Let's let's be optimistic. It's pretty smart. But we're talking about fantasy people that we should be looking at or not what do you guys do at zeke both for the final five or six four or five weeks left in your fantasy season and even beyond um I'm, I'm trying to decide this week i have a lot of decisions to make and zeke is a part of those decisions um i'm thinking about playing Devonte parker over zeke is what i'm thinking about right now that's where i'm at and i mean uh, you know haven't made the final decision but it seems like not an unreasonable point right now with Jalen Waddle out and it's going against the Jets uh, I don't know so it just hasn't been good with Zeke and I think that what you're playing with Zeke right now is you hope that the offense puts him in a fortuitous situation and he falls into the end zone right because I think beyond that we haven't seen a hell of a lot out of him right, right? and that's you know that's a concern I, I don't know that Tony Pollard makes it back this week he was on the practice field today I'm sure that helps a little bit but but he you know let's not pretend Tony Pollard's been great either. He's had some right. great plays, right? And Zeke has been so bad that it makes Tony Pollard look better maybe than he is. So, so I don't want to get over enthusiastic about the whole situation. I'm not keen on, you know, I'm, like I'm totally invested in Dak and I'm hoping for a huge rebound uh, and the hope is cheap. So I tend to indulge myself, but 
uh, I'm not entirely sure I'm going to get that rebound. And, and I'm, I'm, I feel the same about Zeke. I know that, you know, maybe this team is hoping, you know, just get in the playoffs and hoping Zeke is healthier then. Um, and based on what he said, his comments after the MRI, um, you know, maybe there is a chance he can be healthier as they hit the playoffs. Uh, but I think that's their, you know, desired outcome. And then that doesn't jive with my desired outcome. I need help now. My playoffs are now. Exactly. So Reese brought up a point that I think he was hinting at. What do we do with him next year? Because there will be people, there will be steam. Hey, he's healthy now. Give him in the first round. And then there'll be some of us who are jaded or like, I'm not touching that guy until the fourth. Yeah, I, I, you know, so number one, everyone has value, right? It's just, you know, how, how you see it. I mean, it's not, there is nobody who I will say, I'll never draft that guy. Right. That's why I said so, four. So, yeah. So, I mean, it, and I think that's what it's going to come to. How far does he fall? And I think we'll, we'll have to get that determination. Maybe that'll be determined, you know, like a strong finish changes a lot of things for people, right? What do we remember? We remember the last thing we saw, right? And if Zeke has a handful of huge games to close out the season, that's all we're going to remember. So, uh, and I'm willing to be part of that. I'm willing to only remember that part if it's really good, especially in the leagues where I have them. So I think that'll, I, I think Reese, the answer is yet to be determined for me. Like, I'm going to be dialing back. I want younger players anyway, uh, especially at running back. But you don't always get them. And uh, volume is still king, right? That's the thing we're chasing. And until I don't see Zeke getting the volume, uh, which he's not getting right now, by the way, um, that, you know, that's going to be the that's going to be the determining factor for me is what kind of volume. I, anticipated volume is almost exclusively what I'm drafting, uh, you know, once we get past the first handful of guys who you know are getting the volume. And then you're trying to judge – Wow, how great can they be with all that volume? Yes. You brought out the final strong finishes. I was thinking back to 2015. David Johnson had not really been doing much with the Cardinals. And then the final four or five games, particularly a Sunday night game, yep. the Eagles, where he just starts going off. And then there's a ton of steam to take him top four or five picks. And he turns yep. into a top three running back with Todd Gurley and Le'Veon Bell. Where are those guys in the NFL anyways? Uh, so <laughs> it's funny because we mentioned Bloom. I think it was Bloom I was talking to. I was on the couch with Bloom and we were uh, that year talking about players we liked that were going to come out of nowhere. And I predicted it would Johnson would be one of those guys. And uh, I haven't been right about anything since. So I like to bring that up. Um, but then, you know, the next year, I mean, we've seen it with other guys too that kind of come out of nowhere. Arian Foster, you know, the, there's always a rant. But every year there are backs that come out of nowhere that do great things only to vanish, right? So, you know, Justin Forsett is waving from us somewhere. Mike uh, Davis. You know, Mike Mike Davis. I mean, the, yeah, there's tons of them. Every year there's there's tons of them. But also, you know, they'll win you fantasy titles the year that they show up. Yeah. Uh, this Maybe this year it's Rashad Penny, although I don't feel good about this week, Rashad. <laughs> um, but but that's, that's part of it. So and we have to be careful about that last thing we remember, right? And so... You know, is it real? Is it a mirage? Was it a flash in the pan kind of situation? Is Devontae Freeman really the, in the 2016 Devontae Freeman again? I mean, I'm probably thinking not, but, you know, if he has a strong finish to the season, people are going to be interested. I mean, it's already been stronger than you would have ever imagined, right? So people are going to remember that and, and, uh, and hopefully uh, be willing to overpay for him while I'm waiting for guys to fall down behind. Yeah. yeah. I'd much rather, if they're going within four rounds of each other, I'd much rather have J.K. Dobbins than Devonta Freeman. Right, me too. And it, my dynasty shares of Dobbins are ready to rebound. But we're talking about uh, guys that came out of nowhere. Cordero Patterson, what do you do with him in the draft next year? I don't know what the hell we're going to do with him. So Free two agent. things. He didn't actually come out of nowhere. I want to credit the Orlando Ledbetter, who has been coming on. He started in, it was May or June. He said, guys got to watch Cordero Patterson. They're going to do things. They've got big plans for him. Watch him. Because we kept talking about Mike Davis. Man, Mike Davis. I, no, I'm telling you guys. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, credit, to, credit to D. Orlando uh, for that. Dio's always got a finger to the pulse there. But, but uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't know what, I don't know how positive I feel about this. Is this lightning in a bottle? I, my, you know, as we sit here right now, I, I think we talked about it before. You know, it's, I feel like Arthur Smith has cracked the code. Right. There's Cordero Patterson does a limited number of things really well as a receiver. He does some things well and a lot of things not well as a runner. He does some things well and a lot of things not well. 
And Arthur Smith has put together a, a package that allows him to do the things he excels at. And uh, it works fantastically. And maybe it's just true. Arthur Smith is a genius. Um, I would suggest if that's actually true, Kyle Pitts would be better, but yes. we'll leave that for another time. Um, and maybe it's just coverages, right? You can't account for Calvin Ridley being gone and you know, every number one corner shadowing your tight end, right? So, uh, but, but I'm hoping he cracks the code on him eventually too. But, but, but that's probably part of it, right? That's why Arthur Smith was hired. Uh, is he's a, he's a sharp offensive mind, a creative offensive uh, a designer of offenses. So um, I'm probably going to be drafting. I'm probably not going to have a lot of shares of Patterson because I'm probably not going to be willing to draft him where he goes. Um, would like to have him, but think it's going to be really high priced and maybe higher priced than I want to pay. And he's in his thirties free agent, but part of what you struck on, I think if I'm going to broaden it up macro, make it macro for society. LeBron James gets rewarded on how well he sh shoots a basketball. Tom Brady throws a football. Tiger Woods, when he played, hits a golf ball. We don't care how well Tom Brady hits a golf ball, right? Right. And, but Arthur Smith, like what we all should be doing in our lives, find out what we do well, and you'll be rewarded for doing those better than anyone else. Yes. And, and our society is like, oh, what are your strengths and weaknesses? I'm like, I don't care. Just tell me what your strengths are, and let's try to build around those. And yeah, if, if there are weaknesses we have to compensate for, we'll, we'll talk about those. But let's figure out what those strengths are so we know how high the ceiling is. And that's just my view. of You got me a soapbox. <laughs> uh, because as society, we, we care about how to push people down. And I'm like, no, how do we lift that ceiling way up? Right. And to, to his credit, Smith, you know, I mean, he's, you know, made the most of talent in other places. He had, he's had more talent, you know, to be fair in Tennessee. And, uh, but he made the most out of that and uh, turned some players around there that we all, we had all given up on in terms of Ryan Tannehill for sure. So, uh, so credit to him for figuring out the breaking the Rubik's cube that is uh, Cordero Patterson. Cause Lord knows everyone else has tried. Bill Belichick <laughs> couldn't do it, right? So, yeah. But you're brought up Ryan Tannehill. After Arthur Smith this year, Tannehill's not been as good as he was previously. He's turned the ball over more, and part of that has to do with A.J. Brown being hurt, Julio Jones being hurt. But you still should expect at least some ability to protect the football that he was able to do with Arthur Smith. And they lost John in as well. Yes. Yeah. All, and Derek Henry got hurt. All these things are complex, you know, and we sit here and we see, you know, the end result and, you know, like some, a lot of interceptions. Well, how many of those interceptions, I haven't broken them all down and, and reviewed the film, but how many of them are Ryan Tannehill and how many of them are the receiver reading something differently, breaking a route off, doing whatever. I mean, that's the thing we, you know, we look at a quarterback's interceptions and we pin them all in the quarterback but not necessarily they're the quarterback's fault. So, um, so I mean, and look, I've, I've watched enough to know a fair number of them were not great throws. So I'm not pretending that Tannehill's been everything we wanted. And he hasn't been, right? I mean, he guy's been a top 10 quarterback, you know, under Arthur Smith, and now he certainly is not. So uh, there's something to that. But it, it's never as simple as we'd like to make it, uh, you know, in terms of like why a, why, a, why a player that we have high expectations for fails. Uh, you know, sometimes it's as simple as an injury, but for the most part, it's a really complex situation uh, that includes the opponent, includes the supporting cast around them. The offensive line in particular can be an issue for these players. So that's something we'll have to figure out after the season. It goes so fast that it's hard to, uh, hard for a lot, you know, for me, I know, to calculate. And, you know, you sit here and you try and rewatch the games and, and try to pick things up. But until you can really sit back and you're not trying to write 100 articles a day at the same time you're doing all that, it's it can be difficult to figure it all out. Yes. So you brought up earlier in this show the most volatile and uh, most volatile position is running backs. And there's been a ton of it running back injuries this year. Where if you don't have Jonathan Taylor or previously Austin Eckler, but he's gotten nicked up a little bit, you're kind of in trouble. How can we leverage that? into drafting for next season? So we have to be willing to let go of the thing that we've always done, right? And so, I mean, I'm, I'm the, <laughs> that's not easy. I have, a, a, you know, I, I go back a few years back when Antonio Brown was still with the Steelers and kind of was on that unstoppable role. I remember uh, my colleague at Sirius Jeff Mans and now Google Elite as well, 
um, drafted uh, Antonio Brown third overall. You know, people thought, wow, that's crazy. Why would you do that? And, you know, it's a pretty simple answer is there's not as much downside, right? I mean, with every running back, I mean, you know that, you know, that it's a collision sport. You know they're getting in all the collisions, right? And then you know that there's going to be running backs, what I said earlier, running backs who nobody drafted are going to win somebody a league. You have to totally buy into that. And I mean, you know, we've seen people carry this out with the zero RB and modified zero RB and, you know, all these things, uh, uh, all these things. I mean, you have to be willing to embrace those, but also I think you have to get a little lucky when you embrace those, right? I mean, you have to, I mean, identifying the talent or identifying a player on the rise, maybe we can all do that, but securing him before somebody else figures out the same thing and snags him. I mean, there's other, again, it's usually more complex than just the, oh, look, this guy's great. Um, <clears throat> you know, and I think I need to get him. Uh, maybe someone else has seen the same thing. And so, and, and, and obviously things evolve. One of the things that, you know, I think we've talked about before, but um, that we all need to be mindful of is what is today is not tomorrow, right? Things change over the course of season. People figure things out, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> players that are horrible, at something for part of the year. And, you know, I use the same example because it's so obvious, but, you know, halfway through last year, we thought Tom Brady couldn't throw deep. And then at the end of the season, he was the best deep ball throw in the NFL. Right. So things evolve, things change. And yeah. And defenses, I think are a big thing too. We see defenses that get off the horrible starts or historically bad. And then all of a sudden aren't as bad. Like, you know, we still look at Seattle and they go, oh, that's a horrible defense. Well, no, it's gotten better. Right. And so, I mean, we have to be ready to acknowledge that. And I think that's a, a something I'm not as good at as I want to be as like, I grab onto something and go, that, that's what that is. Well, that's what it is today. That's not what it is two weeks from now or not what it's going to be a month from now. And, and so you have to start, you know, thinking at that next level a little bit, which is not easy for us old people. I'm with you. We, we like our ways, Bob. But I also think where Reese is going is if we push running backs down, that means we push, we have to push other stuff up. And most people aren't ready to push quarterbacks up since most of the top ones struggled. So then you're looking at wide receiver heavy other than maybe Jonathan Taylor. But then I'm left with, you know, if I'm with deciding between wide receiver nine or Kittle, Andrews, one of those guys, I might be better off going tight end, right? It may push something else up. Right. There's a, so, I mean, I, you, you could think though, you know, top guys at every position have, you know, or a number of Scott top guys at every position have fallen short of expectations. You know, right now, Travis Kelsey in a bit of a rough patch, Darren Waller missing time with injuries. Uh, so I think that, this, you know, top, you know, George Kittle's on a rampage right now, but he was coming off IR before he hit the rampage. So there were issues with him as well. You look at some of the top wide receivers, Calvin Ridley's not even playing, right? So, I mean, these things can happen in every position. The top quarterbacks, the guys that we went early on, if you were going early on quarterbacks, are not performing at the level we expected. Uh, Patrick Mahomes or Lamar Jackson, you know, and, and, and it's been uneven for Josh Allen. So, uh, so I propose we don't start drafting until the fifth round. <laughs> <laughs> but then whoever has the first pick of the fifth round gets Jonathan Taylor. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> I knew there was a hole in my turn. As long as I get first pick, I don't care. Yes. <laughs> but does Jonathan Taylor go number one or does someone like Monte Adams or? Uh, I think Taylor will, but like, so I had by the, you know, by the time my drafts were rolling pretty good, I had Adams up at number five. Right. And so, I mean, I think, I think there's some room to, you know, maybe go with, you know, go with what you feel. Maybe this is what this is demonstrating. Like, you like a guy at a position that other people aren't drafting at the time you, that you want to draft them, draft them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do think, you know, there is something to positional scarcity, right? You know, there, there are not as many running backs that as there are other players at other positions are certainly not as many tight ends that are high end tight ends. So I get why we're drafting those guys early and why we're investing so heavily. I think we almost went a little overboard on the running backs though this year. Um, I felt like, they were, you know, I mean, so especially the early drafts I was in right after the, the NFL drafts. I mean, I, you know, it was like running backs, the first 14 guys off the board. So maybe we need to rethink some of that. But some of this is like, you know, eliminating downside is a good thing. I'm not sure in today's NFL if there is a way to eliminate the downside. I mean, it's just these guys are so big and move so fast. 
Uh, you know, I mean, and it's such there's the collisions are great. And I mean, it's just, it's a tough call. You're taking your chances. If you deviate from the norm, I think as well. So um, I will be, I will be studying this come January. I, every year I keep thinking there's gotta be an answer, right? There's gotta be, you know, I'm sitting here with my Rubik's cube with my Cordero Patterson trying to twist it around and think, what is the answer to some of these big struggles that we have? And every year I think I come up with a reasonable answer and it turns out to not be, to not be reasonable at all, not be a very good answer at all. And Bob, you, you brought up so many points that we will definitely have you on as things get further through towards next year, because, you know, Barkley, Fournette versus A.J. Brown, who's hurt, versus Calvin Ridley, who missed time, versus Antonio Brown and all that craziness. Those are some great conversations for the offseason. Yes. Oh, yeah. So, and I like for me, that's, you know, that's when the thinking starts. I mean, in season, you know, I, and, you know, I, I might be a little different than other people, but it's a lot of reacting, right? I mean, once the season starts, I have a tiger by the tail and it's dragging me through the weeds, right? And I'm feeling like I'm just lucky if I can get lineup set in my 29 leagues and, and get all my work done. And, you know, I'm not sitting, I'm not doing the kind of next level thinking I'd like to do while I'm playing. So I do a lot of it in the off season when nobody's playing. Um, but I think it's still helpful to sit around and kind of, you know, work on your processes and see what you hit on, see what you missed on, see why you missed it. I think that's as important as anything, because that's how you learn the lessons going forward is why was I wrong? Why was this not a good idea? What, what, what were the factors? Because maybe it was still a good idea, right? <laughs> you know, that it didn't work doesn't mean it was a bad idea. It just might not have worked. And maybe you need to sit back and maybe refine it a little bit or, or at least understand why it didn't work. Uh, so you can say, oh, yeah, that was a total. total Always about I, need, process. I, need to, I need to figure that. I need to figure out something better. But I, those are the things that I love doing that uh, in the off season. And I think that that's, you know, I think people that do that kind of end up in a little better place going into the season. For me, you know, I mentioned I'm in all those leagues. I want to draft really good because the better I draft and if I, I need some luck to, for those to pan out, but the better choices I've made on draft day, that's going to determine. The draft is going to determine my success. And leagues, because like I said, when you're in, you know, close to 30, you know, redraft leagues, you know, I'm not out there on the waiver wire at the same time everyone else is. I'm not able to have that agility and flexibility that people that are in a couple leagues or 10 leagues or 20 leagues even have. Right. So I need to, you know, I need to, 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 to hit my marks really well. So I put a lot of effort into it uh, before the season and then I hope for the best. Uh, and look, I'm not saying I don't hit the waiver wire and play free agency, but it, but it's more the first come first serve as opposed to getting in there and, and putting in a bunch of bids in all those leagues. I'm just, it's not realistic for me to do it. So uh, I think, you know, some of the processes of how I identify, you know, things in advance, playing the waiver wire in advance, that's something I'm, I think it's really important. You know, you're a couple of weeks away from buys, you know, start making the moves now, right? I mean, yeah. being a little more proactive about some of the things I need to do to, to keep my team from going completely off the rails. And that is successful almost 2% of the time. <laughs> Bob, we appreciate you that you're in a busy time of the schedule. And we really do appreciate you carving out a few minutes to enlighten us with and entertain us. You are a, an awesome guest and we appreciate it, Bob. Well, I appreciate it. I love coming on with Reese and you're all right too, Jeff. Hey, I don't mind carrying the water to feed you know to make sure you guys don't go thirsty i don't nice. mind that but uh we appreciate having you on bob and uh we'll hit you up in the future thank you once again appreciate the invite look forward to chopping it up in the off season when we can dive deep hopefully soon have a great one bye, bye.